The Mad Baron of Urga, a historical horror story. The following is a little known bit of history in a far off corner of the world which, at the time, was a forgotten land, but which many have forgotten that, centuries before, had been the center of power in the largest empire on Earth. Mongolia, a disputed territory caught in the past decades in the Russian and Chinese spheres of influence, was in almost total loss of its independence and its armies once the terror of the world were distant memory. However, unbeknownst to the steppe herders and Brutist priests living in Mongolia, their land would, for a brief moment, be the setting of one of the most bizarre, disturbing, cruel, and for some, inspiring events to come out of the Russian Civil War. The brief rule of Mongolia by Baron Roman Nikolai Maximilian von Ungern Sternberg, under whose psychotic reign Mongolia would come closest to attaining its lost imperial ambitions. Born in Graz, the son of Baltic German nobles in service to the Russian Empire on December 29, 1885, Roman spent most of his childhood in the Russian Imperial Governorate of Estland, today Estonia. Viciously proud of his noble lineage and vehemently hateful of the idea that the lower classes should have rule, Sternberg had a deep appreciation of status, and combined with a seemingly out-of-place hatred for Slavs, Sternberg was convinced that it was the German aristocrats and nobles from the first Viking settlements in Russia that had made Russia great. This led to an almost fitting support for the idea that Russia would be an Asiatic empire, that it was not so much a Russia of Russians as an empire destined to dominate the East. With the 1905 revolution and the establishment of a Duma, Sternberg was furious, asserting any such concessions were an affront to the empire and the autocracy, which he viewed should only ever be absolute. Sternberg had an absolute disdain for any such liberal ideas as representative government or democracy. For him, there was only the rule of God and the warlord. Upon his graduation from Pavlovkoi Military School in St. Petersburg, his interest in Tibetan and Eastern mysticism, as well as Buddhism and Hinduism, was noted by his teachers. Following his graduation, Sternberg joined the Amursky Cossacks, an Asiatic division stationed in Siberia where, owing to both the native Mongols around him and the Asians serving in his unit, his interest into Buddhism intensified. Always known for being the more physical type and ha than having an interest in intellectual pursuits, it was remarked how much Sternberg was drawn towards drunken brawls with other officers. During one such occasion when a sword blow scarred his face, it was said that the blow also damaged his brain turning Sternberg's eastern curiosity and brutish nature to what has been described as raw insanity and insatiable rage. Though Sternberg was not without his strengths, he was quite physically fit and an excellent writer, and was an eager student when studying Buddhism. When the First World War broke out, Ungern and his Cossacks were deployed to the Galatian Front against Austria. Throughout the first years of the war, Sternberg took part in numerous bloody engagements against the Austrians and the Germans. He was remarked as being extremely brave, but reckless and mentally unstable, a man who thoroughly enjoyed killing people. He was court-martialed for attacking an officer with a sword, but was also decorated with Russia's highest combat award, the St. George's Cross. Sternberg was fighting the Caucasus when the February Revolution of 1917 occurred, toppling the Tsar and establishing a republic. As repugnant as this event was to Roman, he accepted it as the alternative to a much worse system. Following minor battles won against the Turks, Sternberg and his new colleague, a half-Asian officer named Grigory Semyonov, went on to form a Russian unit comprised largely of Asians, notably the Buryats. Following the outbreak of the Civil War, Sternberg and Semyonov declared their allegiance to the White Cause and began their campaign in Asia by disarming the Russian-held garrison in Mongolia, which had declared their allegiance to the Bolsheviks. It was said that by sheer force of will and terror, Sternberg managed to force the garrison to surrender without firing shot. As time passed, Sternberg's reputation, particularly among the Buryats and Mongols around him, grew, and he gained a devoted and sizable following, earning notice from Chinese warlords and Japanese officers alike. Delving further and further into Eastern mysticism, Sternberg would consult Tibetan and Buddhist soothsayers, and in drug-fueled hallucinations would find himself the subject of mystical visions. Particularly of interest was the story of the Shambhala prophecy. Now it is a large kingdom, millions of men with the king of the world as their ruler. He knows all of the forces of the world and reads the souls of humankind and the great book of their destiny. Invisibly he rules 800 million men on the surface of the earth, and they will accomplish his every order. The crowns of kings, great and small, will fall, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There will be terrible battles among all the peoples. The seas will become red. The earth and the bottom of the seas will be strewn with bones. The kingdoms will be scattered. Whole peoples will die. Hunger, disease, crimes unbeknown to the laws, never before seen in the world. Seeing around him a world consumed by vice, Sternberg began to form his new vision of the world. His divine purpose to save a world being led into the abyss, and Mongolia and her past were going to help him accomplish this. Sternberg rejected the white leadership of Kolchak, believing him to be far too democratic, far too willing to compromise the right of kings. Eventually, Sternberg formed his own personal army, the Asiatic Cavalry Division, comprised of volunteers from all corners of Eurasia. Everyone from Poles to Japanese were in his ranks. The province of Duaria in China became Sternberg's stronghold, the land of fortress from which attacks against the Red Army were launched and the surrounding villages and towns reduced to ash. The only sound being heard were the screams of raped women. So violent and medieval were Roman's method, Duaria became known as a center of torture, the bones of his hundreds of victims filling up the place. As it was described by one, on these rolling hills where everywhere were rolling skulls, skeletons, and decaying body parts, Baron Ungern used to like to go there to rest. Another account, dried slices of human flesh gangling from nail, blood has so saturated the ground under the building that the soil has become discolored and befouled. Sternberg had surrounded himself with an assortment of vicious and cruel violent Russian officers such as Igor Sipailov, who organized a massacre at Lake Baikal, where red prisoners had their heads smashed in by ice mallets, as well as Buddhist mystics and holy men. Ungern and his what could easily be described as a horde pillaged train after train, running through Siberia and northern China. The fanatic Sternberg had an especial hatred for Jews. He would kill any he found on plundered trains. So feared was Roman that it was described he could petrify a man with a stare. When an obnoxious passenger annoyed Ungern, the Baron fixed him with the steel, steady gaze of his grey eyes and questioned him about his credentials, leading to the arrogance and importance of the yesterday's poor disappeared. Entirely disappeared. And before the Iron Baron, there was a pitiful, cringing coward. With a solid force of brutal, yet effective fighting men, Sternberg went south to Mongolia with his hopes of restoring the Mongol Empire, an absolute autocratic monarchy he believed was the only thing that could save civilization from the revolutionary forces which were tearing it apart. Before Mongolia, though, Sternberg went to China to establish himself with other eastern monarchists and warlords, and it was there he married Princess Ji in an orthodox Christian ceremony. The bloody baron had his queen. In late 1920, with the White Army collapsing, Sternberg made his move. Completely separating his Asiatic cavalry from Kolchak, he moved into Mongolia, fulfilling for some the prophecy that a messianic hidden king in the form of a warrior would liberate Mongolia from Chinese rule from the north, riding on a white horse. When his demands that the Chinese occupiers be disarmed were rejected, Sternberg and his men assaulted Urga unsuccessfully. However, bolstered by Mongols seeing him as their savior, in including a blessing from the nominal head of Mongolia, the Bogd Khan, Sternberg at this point disciplined his Russian soldiers with incredible harshness and cruelty. Beatings and floggings were frequent. In contrast, his Mongol volunteers were treated with immensely more respect. It was said that his standard punishment was 100 lashes with bamboo on every part of the body, the effects of which surprised Roman, who remarked, did you know that men can still walk when the flesh and bone have separated? In February, Sternberg's forces surrounded the Chinese at Urga, who had dug in and had a force many times greater than his own. Temperatures averaged around minus 30 Celsius. Sternberg secured victory by sowing confusion within the city with an assault at night, and using the same tactics employed by Genghis Khan, he surrounded the city with his campfires, making it appear that his, that his force was far greater than it actually was. What ensued was a battle of utmost ferocity and psychotic violence. Appearing less like a modern battle, the Battle of Urga resembled more closely a medieval-style bloodbath, with Sternberg leading the charge on his horse, sword in hand. Men died in their thousands. After the Chinese were defeated and Urga fell into Sternberg's hands, he ordered all of the Jews in the city killed. And when the Mongols and the Christian missionaries protested this uncommon practice of discriminatory murder, these dissenters were killed as well. So many bodies were left on the streets that packs of wild dogs devoured the dead. Growling and yapping creatures drew and tore at long, bloodstained strings of entrails. Following further skirmishes, the Chinese had been driven out of Mongolia, and the Bogd Khan in a ceremony in early 1921 was proclaimed 
monarch of an independent Mongolia, with Sternberg as dictator. With a steady stream of Russian refugees fleeing the civil war, Sternberg's paranoia became extreme. He prosecuted and tortured anyone he believed to be a communist sympathizer or a Jew. In addition, the cruelty of his entourage, most notably Sipilov, was mixed with greed, where in one instance, a Danish businessman was dragged across the countryside behind a car until he could reveal where he had stored his gold. A mystic who was fascinated by the beliefs and religions of the Far East, such as Buddhism, and who believed himself to be the successor to Genghis Khan, Sternberg's philosophy was an exceptionally muddled mixture of Russian nationalism with Chinese and Mongol beliefs. His traditionalism and Orientalism contributed to his reputation as the Mad Baron. Ungern Sternberg inverted Western fears of the Yellow Peril, arguing that the West was morally corrupt and degenerate with the forces of mad revolution controlled by the Jews were running amok while the East had mostly maintained its moral purity, and he would lead a pan-Asian army to cleanse the West of its sickness via a bloodbath. The exceptionally sadistic Ungern Sternberg regarded extreme violence as spiritual cleansing based on his understanding of Buddhism, and believed that the world needed a bloodbath to undergo a spiritual regeneration. Such raw power, fear, and mysticism did Sternberg possess. Many of those around him believe him to be the incarnation of the god of war. However, the dream of a new Mongol empire that would purify the western world in a baptism of blood soon collapsed in 1921. Despite his ruthless paranoia, communists had infiltrated Mongolia, and while raiding Soviet territory in Siberia, Bolshevik forces had captured Urga, and while on retreat to Tibet, following a failed assassination by his own men, he was finally captured by the Reds put on a show trial that lasted for over six hours, and on September 15th, 1921, the Mad Baron, God of War, was executed by a red firing squad. Upon hearing of his death, the Bogd Khan ordered prayers for his soul to be read throughout Mongolia. They were undoubtedly needed. What is one to make of such a figure, of such a history? Was Sternberg doomed from the start? A simple brutish psychopath whose delusions were fed one too many times? Or should he be viewed as a man who brought hope to the Mongols that, in a brief moment, saw their empire restored? Or should he simply be seen as a monstrous fanatic whose bloodlust and cruelty were so insatiable he had only found an outlet in his mysticism? Or can his cruelty be overlooked, and can he be looked on with a, with a sort of inspiration that, with sheer will and knowledge of histories, one man can forge an empire, even in the modern age? After all, the deaths that hit his hands were nowhere comparable to those dead in the Civil War or the genocidal regimes to follow in Russia and China. Such behavior and ideas would have been commonplace in centuries past. So perhaps the most disturbing thing about all this is that Ungarn's story is simply anachronistic. Doch sie hielten an und küssten sich so fern wie